Right. Hello. I think I'm live. Hope I'm live. I'm not even awake. I'm just going to jump right into it. I've been looking at the live chat and there seems to be varying levels. Um, like some of those are jokes, obviously, but varying levels of understanding of what Calvinism is. So before I attempt to refute it biblically, all five points, um, I'll give you a brief, uh, like a history or a background on John Calvin, when he was, who he was, you know, that kind of thing. So I can't see the live chat at the moment, so I hope you'll forgive me. Calvinism also is uh, called Reformed Theology, and it's a movement, um, it's a denomination also, but it originated as a movement within Orthodox Protestantism, um, and it was, as I intimated, developed by John Calvin. He was born in 1509, and he died in 1564, and he was French, he was a theologian, and he was around eight years old when Luther, Martin Luther, nailed up his uh, 95 theses. And Calvin and Luther never, never met. Uh, so Calvin was a lawyer, whereas uh, Luther actually trained to be a lawyer before switching. Um, and Calvin later became in Geneva a pastor. Uh, and that's in Switzerland, for anybody who doesn't know. He married in 39, 1539. And he produced many, many commentaries on varying uh, and various books of the Bible. He's best known for his seminal work, which is the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Um, and it's a pretty good work, actually, and it expounds on Christian theology. And he published this uh, when he was only 26, so he wasn't a slacker. The system which he developed, Calvinism, adheres to uh, a very high view, I guess, of scripture, and it seeks to derive formulations of theology based solely on God's word. So there's nothing wrong with that, like sola scriptura, obviously. Um, so yeah, so this is what it seeks to do. And it focuses in doing this and goes horrifically wrong by the end on God's sovereignty. And it claims and states assertively that God is able and willing uh, by virtue of his omniscience, his omnipresence and his omnipotence to do whatever he desires with his creation. Um, Calvinism also uh, declares and maintains that within the Bible are the following teachings. Uh, that God, by his sovereign grace, predestines people into salvation. That Jesus died only, huh, only, for those who are predestined, that God regenerates the individual to where the individual is then able and wants, like willing and wants, to, desires to choose God, and, and uh, that it is impossible for those who are redeemed to lose their salvation. And it's kind of antithetical, I guess, to Arminianism. Maybe I'll do uh, like something on that another time. Um, Calvinism emphasizes the sovereignty of God and his eternal decrees by which he has ordained uh, whatsoever shall come to pass. Calvinists take the Bible very seriously um, and try to harmonize, as do we all, to be fair, and try to harmonize all of its concepts. Um, they teach uh, monogism, that salvation is accomplished in God's work alone. That's a uh, yeah, there's some Bible references for that. John 6, 28 to 29 and Philippians uh, 1, 29. Nothing, they also teach that nothing occurs in the world except that God has given permission. Ephesians 1, 11 is uh, what they use for that. Um, others outside of Calvinism have um, asserted and maintained that Calvinism makes God the author of evil. However, unsurprisingly Calvinists are quick to deny like the accusations and they teach or say they teach that God is sovereign even over the forces of evil <laughs> that's fine and that he uses evil uh, within his eternal plan for the world and for mankind um, 
For truly in this city they were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. And that's Acts 4, 27 to 28. You'll see that in Calvinist uh, literature. However, one could argue, one has argued, <laughs> that this is uh, pertaining to Jesus Christ. Anyway, you may have heard the acronym TULIP, nothing to do with Amsterdam. It's all to do with um, the first letters because it's an acronym. Um, so these are what they stand for. And then we're going to go through solely with Bible verses because hashtag I'm a Protestant. Um, and yeah, basically we're going to uh, aim to refute these points. So there's total, the T stands for total depravity. That's also known as total inability um, and original sin. There is the U standing for unconditional election. And I just saw some questions on that, so we'll we'll get to that. The L stands for limited atonement, also known as particular atonement. The I stands for irresistible grace. And the P is the perseverance of the saints, which is also known as once saved, always saved. You may have heard of that. And I should say, uh, really, that these five categories do not compromise Calvinism in totality. There are different kinds of Calvinists. Um, however, these uh, represent the main point. So if these are refuted or, you know, if you're not comfortable with them in your own personal theology, then, of course, you may discount uh, Calvinism as your preferred means of studying the Bible and practicing your faith. So... Um, yeah, I guess we'll go through one through one by one rather. So T for tulip, uh, so T of tulip, total depravity. So this is the teaching that sin has affected all parts of man. So far, so good. The heart, the emotions, the will, the mind, the body, all affected by sin. We are utterly, completely, totally, one could say, sinful. We are not as sinful as we could be but we are completely affected by sin. And the doctrine of total depravity is derived from the scriptures that reveal human character, basically, uh, that man's heart is evil in Mark chapter 7, uh, sickness in Jeremiah 17, that man is a slave of sin in Romans 6, that he doesn't seek for God in Romans 3, he cannot understand spiritual things, which is in 1 Corinthians. He is at enmity with God, as in Ephesians 2, and is by nature a child of wrath. And that's from Ephesians 2 also. The Calvinist then, with these scriptures in mind, asks the question, in light of these scriptures um, that declare man's true nature as being utterly lost and incapable, this is, the, this is the kicker, how is it possible for anybody to choose or desire God? You can, I can see, sorry, I hope you can see, where that is just throwing a massive spanner in the works because uh, the rest of us like rely on those tenets of free will and, you know, choosing basically. Um, and the answer according to the Calvinist is um, he can't, man cannot. Um, therefore, therefore, so this puts like a, I don't know, a caveat on onto God. Therefore, God must predestine. Um, and Calvinism also maintains that because of our fallen nature, which we all agree to, obviously, um, we are born again, not by our own will. This is also a, a, a massive point of contention, but by God's will. And they do use John 1, uh, 12, 12 to 13 for that. They state that God grants that we believe. Uh, faith is the work of God. God ordains people to eternal life, and they use Acts 13, uh, John 6, 28 and 29, and Philippians 1, 29 again for those three statements, and that God predestines. And that is certainly uh, mentioned in the Bible. It's just the understanding and the like extrapolation that I find contentious. So now to the refutation of total depravity. Um, it's also total inability, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but so it's total depravity, but it's actually taught as the total inability of man to choose the truth. And the Calvinist um, 
throughout history, Calvinism has played these kind of like games, basically linguistic games. The word of God teaches that God created man with the ability to reason, to choose and to receive truth. That's me reminding you. So and these are the verses that I have um, in support of my stance on this. So Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. If you are to receive a gift, you have you have to be able to choose to refuse the gift, obviously, or to not ask for it in the first place. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How would one choose the truth if one hasn't heard the truth? But still, it comes by hearing. Um, and then I'm asserting that that involves a decision making process. So James, because otherwise uh, all of the Muslim da'wah, like you'd, you'd only have to read the word of God to people and they'd just be like, you know, choosing or non-choosing, just uh, have faith. So James 1, 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive, i.e. take something out well, with meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. It's not will save yourself. So apart from the receive, it is able to. It doesn't denote to me um, like, you know, that it forcibly will do so even against your will. Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together. Say if the Lord. So it's literally God saying, let us reason together. Though your skin, sorry, not your skins, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So God is commanding us or advising us strongly to come um, together with him and reason. One cannot reason if one has no recourse to the truth. Um, and uh, Deuteronomy 30, 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore... Choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. How can one choose if we have a total inability? Of course, we can. Joshua 24, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Utterly, like explicitly um, asserting that we have the choice of either evil or goodness. Um whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's Yahweh. Psalm 119 uh, verse 30 and then um, 111 and then 173. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. Clearly a choice. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. So have I taken, uh, could have rejected, obviously. And let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. Um, again, implying that um, David could have rejected them. And now we go to John 1.12, uh, which is used, um, yeah, which is used uh, for, for both argument and counter argument, actually. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And 2 Timothy, finally, for the T, the total inability or depravity, 2 Timothy 1.12, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So two parts there. The Lord has committed it. Um, but also, I know whom I have believed. You can disbelieve if you have no recourse to the truth. You can't believe something to be trustworthy. You just uh, you're unable to, you know, to receive truth. Full stop. Whether by um, you know reasoning or any other means. So let's get on to unconditional election. Uh, not much to say about it from the Calvinistic side, but I've got a bit. So God doesn't 
base his election, this is the claim, on anything he sees in the individual. He chooses the elect, the elect are, we'll get around to that, I guess, chooses the elect um, according to the kind intention of his will. And this, for this, uh, they use Ephesians 1, 4 to 8 and Romans 9, 9 to 11. Without any consideration or, of merit or quality within the individual, nor does God look into the future to see who would pick him. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, lest God learns and reacts to man's choices. Twaddle, poppycock, just... Oof. Also, as some are elected into salvation, others are not. Kind of Allah style, if you like. Some are predestined to heaven, some are predestined, therefore, by extension to hell, eternally. But no, for no badness, because if we're not looking for any goodness whatsoever, um, or any, you know, anything at all, then... The same is true for the counter example. So unconditional election, let's see. So within this, Calvinism is teaching that God selects those who are to be saved without any condition, pretty much like a lottery, I guess. Um, but the Bible teaches that there is, of course, hopefully like somebody has thought of this by now, that there is one condition to salvation and that condition is faith. Like Spoiler alert. So 1 Peter 1, 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Excuse me. So that's conditional. 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, 13, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Belief, again, of the truth. You can't believe the truth if you have a total inability or depravity. And it's also this belief in the truth, i.e. faith, that is the reason that um, you have been chosen. And therefore, that debunks that God doesn't look into the future um, to see the results of our own free will, because otherwise we're just uh, like automatons. Luke seven fifty: thy faith have saved thee. Thank you. The what has saved you? The what? God's uh, just a lottery system? No, nope, no, nope, it's the faith. Um, your faith, as it were, thy faith. And Ephesians 2.8, finally for this section. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. So the not of yourselves part, i.e., you know, it's not because you've, I don't know, got a nice colour hair or you're a little bit, you know, you're you're attempting to be righteous outside of the Holy Spirit, etc., it's the faith, and you have been saved by faith, and not of works, lest any man should boast. Just want to chuck that in for anyone else. Um, but yeah, it is a gift, and it is not a compulsion. But we'll come on to that. So now we're going to look at um, limited atonement. Sorry, L, my brain just went dead for a second there. Okay, so limited atonement. Jesus died. This is like pretty preposterous really jesus died only for the elect this this elite group of uh saved people who are predestined through no merit of their own no nothing um though jesus's sacrifice was sufficient for everybody calvinists argue it was not efficacious for everybody so jesus only bore the sins of the elect it is claimed Support for this position is drawn from such scriptures as Matthew 26, 28, where Jesus died for many, in inverted commas, uh, John 10, 11, which, um, which says that Jesus died for the sheep. Uh, and as per Matthew 25, the inference is not for the goats. Um, although I would take that back to there are sheep other than uh, these who hear my voice, not of this fold. So they're all sheep, like they're just Jews and Gentiles. Uh, John 17, 9, where Jesus in prayer interceded for the ones given him. I'm going to sneeze, sorry. Uh, oh, excuse me. So where were we? Gosh, where were we? Limited determinant. Yeah, where Jesus in prayer interceded for the ones given to him. Um, and we read that actually yesterday uh, in the video about uh, John's gospel. Um, not those is the claim of the entire world. 
um, Acts 20, 28 and Ephesians 5, 25, 27 combined, um, which is basically that the church was purchased by Christ, not all people, you know, just the church. And Isaiah 53, 12, which is a prophecy of Christ's crucifixion, where he would bear the sins of many, i.e. the implication, not all. Though I would uh, confidently assert that the whole world is uh, many. But yeah, let's, um, let's just quickly get the counter for those. Excuse me. Oh, gosh. Okay, so limited, yeah, limited atonement. Okay, so Calvinism is teaching with, with these verses and with their theology that Christ died only for the elect, solely for the elect. There's no chance for anybody else because you can't accept the truth because you're totally uh, unable or, to, you know, total depravity. There's um, there's nothing you can do to change your elect or non-elect status um, because of unconditional election. So, yeah, the limited atonement part. Uh, the reason that not all are saved, it's claimed, is because they failed to repent and receive the Saviour. How can one repent if one doesn't know the truth? You know, um, and not because he didn't provide for their salvation. So that's a way that they'll argue back at you. So Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, i.e. Yahweh, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So that's the all. Um, and it's, you know, that verse begins with all and ends with all. So who's being spoken about? All. First Timothy 4.10. For therefore we both labour and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the saviour of all men, um, especially of those that believe. So there's a clear distinction between believers and unbelievers but he is the, he can be and he is the saviour of all men if they will have the faith, according to the rest of us, you know, and if they choose uh, to reason with God and receive the truth as they are able to do as, you know, agents of free will. Um, 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only. Gasp, I hear you uh, <laughs> gasp but also for the sins of the whole world. I mean, John didn't put it in capital letters, but I just did with my voice. Hebrews 2.9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, like i.e. in order that he can die, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for, wait for it, every man. That's not to the exclusion of women. That's as in mankind, every man. 1 Timothy 2, 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So it's, again, it's all, it's not some, it's not limited, it's unlimited, as it were. Limited by other things, as in your position, like of faith or unbelief, but that's about it. So anyway, let's get to irresistible grace. Mm. I'm not really a fan of this. Well, none of them, to be fair. Irresistible grace. When God, this is the teaching of Calvin, when God calls his elect into salvation, they cannot resist. Something just fell down in another room. Okay. I, I do mean it. One can resist. I mean, to be fair, actually, I'm not talking to my upstairs neighbours. I'm just thinking out loud now. To be fair. Hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, my own conversion was pretty forceful. However, we're going to use the Bible. So this is the teaching of Calvin anyway. When God calls his elect into salvation, they cannot resist. God offers to all people the gospel message. This is called the external call. But to the elect, God extends an internal call and it cannot be resisted. This call is by the Holy Spirit who works in the hearts of minds of the elect to bring them to repentance and regeneration, whereby they willingly and freely come to God. So it's forcibly, and yet this teaching is that they are malleable enough to be brought into willingness. Um, some of the verses used in support of this teaching are Romans 9.16, 
uh, which says, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who has mercy. And then Philippians 2, 12 to 13, where God is said to be the one working salvation in the individual. John 6, 28 and 29, again, where faith is declared to be the work of God. Uh, Acts 13, 48, where God appoints people to eternal life. And uh, John 1, 12 to 13, being where being born again is not by man's will, but by God's. And I would individually refute them, actually, but it's just the exegesis. Being born again is not by man's will. It is by God's. That doesn't denote an inability to, uh, like, resist that or to not call to be born again, to not, you know, to not desire that. That Those things aren't exclusive. Or well, actually, they are exclusive. Um, okay. So... Uh, irresistible grace. Let's look at some other uh, verses which refute this. Lamentations, it's an unusual one to be sure, uh, 3, 35 to 36. To turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High, to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord does not approve. Approval does not denote uh, like permission or a hindrance, but the Lord does not approve to um, subvert a man in his cause or to turn aside the right of a man before the face of God. So the man, yeah, we have a right to um, resist, basically. Um, Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou hast killest the prophet, <laughs> KJV is, Okay, hold on, I'm just going to read it in English, to be fair. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you have killed the prophets and stoned them which are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. So God's saying, like, I would have done this loads of times. I would have gathered you up, like, etc., etc. But you weren't having it, basically. You wouldn't do it. Um, denoting um, resistance, you know, to what God would, would have. John 5, 39 to 40, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are and they are they which testify of me, um, and you will not come to me that you might have life, i.e. what you're doing, like i.e. there it is, there's the truth, but you won't come. So uh, that also denotes, like, it. they kind of refute, you know, they're interchangeable. That refutes the total depravity, the, the ability to receive the truth. Need I say more? Okay, where were we? We were at Acts 7.51 now. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do you. But... I thought that the Holy Ghost couldn't be, as in the verses that they bring forward, resisted because it's an inner call rather than an external call. Okay, then. And you always resist the Holy Ghost means that the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, obviously, because like I was born in the, you know, like recently, uh, well, not that recently, but um, in comparison with this verse. So, that means that the Holy Spirit is making attempts and you are resisting. You can't resist something that is not coming against you, if you see what I mean. Proverbs 1, 24 to 26. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have set out naught, um, like all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I will look. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. But the pertinent parts of that is I have called and you refused. That's literally refutes irresistible grace. The Calvinists would claim that these people he's speaking to are not the elect. But if God calls, um, we see in other verses, like if God calls, you're coming, basically. Or if God gives, you know whom he has given to the son, the son, uh, you know, will bring to him. We saw that in John yesterday. He said, all that you have given me, none of them have, uh, you know, perished or, or none will perish. But that's at the um, exertions of Jesus, basically. 
So where were we? Yeah, and, and lastly, Proverbs 29, 1. He that bring sorry, he that being often reproved hardens his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. So you're being reproved, reproved, and then you do something, an effort of your will, a hardening of your neck, as it were, metaphorically, and then you will be destroyed, and there is no remedy for that, and that is your choice to harden your neck. So that's uh, like resistance. <laughs> Excuse me. So P, perseverance. Um, this is the last part of the tulip, as it were. Perseverance of the saints, which is also known, obviously, as once saved, always saved. And I've um, got quite a few thoughts on this. So this is the teaching that one cannot lose one's salvation. Because the Father has elected, the Son has redeemed, the Holy Spirit has applied the salvation, those who are thus saved are eternally secure. It's also, yeah, eternal assurance or security. They are eternally secure in Christ. Some of the verses for this position um, in isolation, I would add, are John 10, 27 to 28, where Jesus said his sheep will never perish. Um, they have to be his sheep at the moment of death, if you see what I mean, for this to for, for that to apply. Uh, John 6, 47, where salvation is described as everlasting life. It is everlasting life. It's not everlastingly certain salvation because everlasting is beyond the grave and we can only be saved if you're Protestant. Um, or actually, even if Calvin, uh, sorry, even if Catholicism and purgatory, I guess they're already saved and they're just having a little spa day. So, but yeah, it has to, you have to accept as far as we know before death, uh, the gift of salvation, not the irresistibly like put on you her <laughs> gift or, I don't know, hostage situation of salvation. Okay, so where were we? Yeah, Romans 8, 1, where it said that we have passed out of judgment. We can, how does that say we can't pass back into judgment? Oh, it doesn't, okay. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where God promises to never let us be tempted beyond that which we can handle. Um and Philippians 1, 6, where God is the one being faithful to perfect us until the day of Christ's return. Of course, we know from Paul that on that day, some of us will still be alive. Uh, so still with the ability to choose, although not if you believe uh, Calvinism, quite frankly. So now lastly, perseverance. Um, the Bible actually teaches the preservation of the saints rather than the perseverance of the saints, if you see what I mean. So Jude 1, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22 to 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy, holy with a W. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. We know that the Holy Spirit groans on our behalf. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit like does a lot of work, to be fair, with us and maintaining our salvation, quite frankly. Uh, John 10, 27 to 29. This is the one I quoted earlier. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. So it's not the one that I was thinking of. Um, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So I'm going to just jump back a minute to, I guess, well, this and irresistible grace. Um, nobody can, so let me finish the verse first. Sorry. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Now, in that, excuse me, I'm so sorry. Oh, gosh. Okay, so no man is able to pluck them. That denotes that the no man does not include the man who's being plucked, if that makes sense. And we see from... Uh, Galatians 5, 4, and Hebrews 4, uh, 4 to 6, which I don't have. I don't know why I don't have them. One of them is uh, basically saying that if you were to go and be circumcised as a, like a Gentile Christian man, um, 
you will be alienated or severed from Christ. He will be no avail to you, not if you just can't get circumcised, but if you do it in order to try to um, attain the favour of God outside of the covenant that we have with Christ. And uh, Hebrews talks about those who have tasted the uh, goodness, I think the Holy Spirit is, yeah, um, and have fallen from grace, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that it shows. And also to be severed from Christ, one must be in Christ to be severed from or alienated from. Excuse me. So that's, um, those are also against uh, this perseverance or uh, once saved, always saved. Colossians 3, 3 to 4. For you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you also appear with him in glory. So, oh, my, this is too much. Right, and Hebrews 7, 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. And that's Hebrew. So intercession, uh, why would one need intercession post-salvation if it's a done deal and it's um, like eternally secure? Like I don't mean to frighten you, obviously. Um, it's not a bad thing. It really isn't. that. It's not a bad thing. It's a more reasonable position. I don't mean theologically. I mean of God. Like because we have free will, we can, you know, surely be saved and then again give our lives over to Satan or or you know whatever leads us out we can we can't be snatched but we can uh, walk away but commit suicide as it were um whilst remaining alive so a brief conclusion i guess um it just goes all five points of the tulip are in my mind certainly i don't you know you must do your own soul searching and work out your own salvation in fear and trembling however for me all five points are erroneous um, or the, the, there are errors of logic when using those verses to come to this, uh, to the conclusion of Calvinism. And it's basically, you know, the logical conclusion of Calvinism, I guess, is that, um, you know, God does, is not a respecter of persons. He's unfair. He's, he's not perfectly just because he's just choosing at random, like a, like a postcode lottery or a zip code if you're in America, I guess. So, and he's not, it's, it's not even according his uh, choice here to, you know, whom, of whom to elect. It's not even according to any standard that he has already established. Um, it's just arbitrary. So he's also going against his own, like, covenants and standards and de declarations. Um, and that basically cuts to the root of his love and his justice, which are both perfect, obviously, um, and it also contradicts, as I said earlier, the fact that Christ gave his life for all. And it says it like a good few times. Um, and it also rejects man's ability and responsibility, quite frankly, to like choose his creator as, as you know, as, as the one true God who, who deserves glory and honor and worship eternally. And also, you know, I don't know, to, to be able to love God, to be able to know the truth of God, because you can't receive uh, truth according to the total depravity. So four more little short verses just to round off. Proverbs 24, 23. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. God is, uh, you know. Acts 10, 34 to 35, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that fears him, i.e. God, and works righteousness is accepted with him. And that's in the New Testament. That's not some like Israelite, uh, you know, like given scripture. That's in the New Testament in the book of Acts 10. In every nation, he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted with him. And John 6, 28 to 29, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. That's reputation of faith and works, by the way. 
uh, as opposed to faith alone. And Ephesians 2 8, lastly, for by grace are you saved through faith. That's the beginning and the end of it. And not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. There is no hostage taking, there is no like a uh, mind control, there is no, I don't like, I, I, yeah, I don't get it. I think you'll, you'll clearly see that because of my waffling. Um, but I did mention it, but only in passing, because it says the work of God is to believe in uh, him, basically Jesus Christ. So, yeah, that was a passing reference to that. Uh, OK, so, uh, yeah, does anybody have, and it's good to see you as well, Bob. Do we, Highville, ah, Cherokee, it's just like the old times. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions relating to Calvinism, obviously? I mean, broadly, the Reformation, but no, actually, Calvin or Calvinism. I can't say that I can answer all questions on Calvin. Uh, I do think some of the memes about him are quite funny, to be fair. Thank you, Jeff. Yes. Yes, but Conley, I wasn't actually refuting the scripture. Uh, that would be ridiculous. It's the interpretation of the scripture, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, I've literally heard people say that one has to have works as well as the faith. Although we, we see from um, Ephesians, it, you know, the opposite. It's not the opposite. It's an opposing, a text that opposes the exegesis rather than the Bible doesn't, you know, go against itself. Uh Okay, what was your question, Milos? Because I don't see the uh, live chat whilst I'm reading from the notes. How did Paul know that this work would be complete? Let's get the verse up. Philippians 1, 6. I'm going to read from the World English Bible because that's my preferred Okay, so let's go from, of course, let's go from maybe one four onwards. Nope, because it's still not a complete sentence. Let's just get the whole chapter up. Hold on. Okay, so uh, there's some greetings, etc. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God whenever I remember you, always in every request of mine on behalf of you all, making my requests with joy for your partnership in furtherance of the good news from, or gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So, oh, my, my nose, I'm, I do apologise. So, Milos, your, is your question how can he have certainty or what is he certain of? Like, let me come back to the page because, yeah. Uh, let me go back and read the question. How did Paul know that this work would be complete? How did he know? Um, he says, let's go back again, sorry. He, he doesn't, well, he says being confident of this very thing. So he, he's not, um, he's not actually, so Paul often, uh, Paul sometimes, well, he will make it clear when it's his own opinion or when it's his own feeling and when it's, um, you know, like heavily theological, as it were, but he's being confident in this. He's stating his confidence, i.e. his, um, I guess you could call that a knowledge, like um, I'm confident I will stop this stream soon. I know I will. Um, so I don't know if that's what you're driving at. That's a good question, David. I'm not sure. I've only ever really known one Calvinist, and they're no longer Calvinist. They sort of, huh. it wasn't irresistible to them. Uh, let's see, Calvinism. Let's see. Yeah, I ne never thought of that. Um, I think so. I can see here on Calvinism.org. Uh, it has the Nicene Creed and it hasn't got any um, 
it's got no reputation it's got no um like declarative either way really it's just typed out as it as it stands so i assume that means that they accept it because there's no argument against it my nose is just driving me mental Uh, I don't think they make him sound unjust. I think they make him, yeah, appear to be, yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, what else? Oh, Milos, I think you're speaking to Irresistible. Uh, are you talking about being once saved, always saved? The confidence is in the thing that he's just carried on talking about. It's not a new sentence. The good work, it, it's the spreading of the good of the gospel. That's what he's talking about. Let me read it to you again. Uh, okay. It's a very long sentence, I'm afraid. So it starts, I thank my God whenever I remember you, comma, always in every request of mine on behalf of you all, comma, making my requests with joy, comma, for your partnership in furtherance of the good news from the first day until now being confident of this very thing that I've just mentioned, or if I were Paul, which is the furtherance of the gospel, i.e. the good news, from the first day that it was declared until now, so that they're in a partnership, he's saying, um, with those who he's writing to in the Great Commission, basically. Um, and he is confident of this very thing, the continuation of furtherance, it says here, of the uh, gospel being spread um, as it has been from the first day right until the moment he's writing this. Um, and it's still a comma. So it's still relating to this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day that Christ returns. So the good work that they are doing is the furtherance of the gospel from the first day until now. Yeah, and he also prays that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all discernment so that you may, you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may, may be sincere and without offence until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So obviously it denotes that salvation has already occurred. They wouldn't be spreading the gospel, nor would they have these fruits. However, it doesn't explicitly mention salvation uh, let me just double check that I'm right. Well, no, I'm telling fibs. Um, it's after the full stop, though. So uh, we'll complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Next sentence. It is even right for me to think this way on behalf of you all, because I have you in my heart, because both in my bonds and in, my de and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, again, we're still talking about the gospel, you are all partakers with me in grace, i.e. we are all saved. Um, for God is my witness, how I long after all of you in the tender mercies of Christ Jesus. So God is now witnessing, well, he's asserting the, the extreme truth of the statement that he long, you know, he's got very uh, tender feeling towards them. And then he goes on and on and on, you know, to... Um, complimentary stuff and then advice because it's Paul <laughs> we're talking about bless him so yeah that's uh that's that's my answer my loss uh any more questions Hubert, I, you'd have to give me some verses. I don't know about, you know, I don't know what you're speaking about. Um, thank you, Mohammed. Yes, yes, Milos, I agree with you. He's not talking about a person. He's speaking about God, yeah. Yeah. God, the Holy Spirit, who works through us to assist us in everything, because the fruits that Paul is speaking, uh, that are spoken of is the fruits of the Spirit. So I don't, I, 
that's not countering what I claimed, though. I'm not saying it's not talking about God. I'm saying it's not refer. It's referring to the to the Great Commission, not to salvation. Um, Chuck, I don't know what his position on it was. Uh, and did he keep it under his hat, or was he quite open with it? Like I, yeah, I don't know that. Although it may be quite tedious to like to get an encyclopedia entry or whatever like typed out in the uh, live chat. Hi, Psalm ninety one. Okay, God bless you too, Mohammed. Um, in the name of Jesus, obviously. Uh, yes, yes, but I agree. That's potentially, unfortunately, true, Chuck, and the thing that's probably uh, wrong or, like, the common denominator of slight offness, as it were, is the uh, is the human brain, like, in the human heart. And Do you know what I mean? Like, the, it would be um, remarkable, quite frankly, if it would... Cause, because salvation is open to everyone, because the limited atonement, the L, is, like, erroneous... Because salvation is open to everyone, you know, just in your daily life, like it's maybe obvious or not if you're in a kind of like bubble of just your friends, but everybody is utterly different. Even with this Marxist nonsense, people react in different ways. They have different histories, different psychologies, different spiritual journeys that they're on, different like places in their spiritual journey. They they may be hungry, angry. They may be lonely. They may be tired. They may be depressed. They may be a loner, they may be gregarious, like uncharacteristically or characteristically. All of these different, genetically they're different, their upbringings are different, their reactions, their politics, their, I don't know, lots, so many variables that it would be a nightmare to try to uh, predestine, quite frankly, or to predict. Because determinism, like Hume, um, who's a, you know, a philosopher and a Christian, he used God to argue against, it's not predestination, but it's determinism, which is counterintuitive or is used as an argument against free will. Um, so free will as opposed to determinism. Determinism states that at any given moment in the universe, you there's only one unique possible outcome as in the next second. Everything that led up to that point, it's irresistible as it were, that the next thing will happen throws out any concept of personal responsibility, moral responsibility, because a murderer, it had to happen. He didn't choose to do that, if you see. Um, so there's compatibilism, like you can uh, work both of them into a theory, like a general theory of um, explanation of these things. But determinism is similar, I guess, to predestination. And I don't, it means that you wouldn't have to be grateful to God because it's already a done deal. It's nothing to do with you, quite frankly. You're not getting any favours. Like, you were always destined to this grace and you can't get out of it and you can't choose not to accept it. Like, it, no. It sounds a bit like Islam, to be fair. Like, God uh, guides who, Allah, sorry. Guides who he guides and misguides who he misguides. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I believe... <laughs> Oh, Salam won't ask anything uh, reasonable or he's not looking for an answer. So I'll, thanks, though, for trying, Bill and Dragon. Uh, oh, sorry, I think I just missed my, me being tagged about a couple of times in a... Rory. I don't think you get the gist of what I'm saying, babes, to be fair. None of us are good. No, not one is literally the quote. The the God, the God, sorry, the Holy Spirit, God, works through us. We're, we are unable in that respect. We, we can't save ourselves. Like, that's, yeah, but we have free will in all of it is the point. We can lose this relationship with God. Please. Like, it doesn't take much of an effort of will, which we do have, to, like, fall back into enmity against God, and it can happen really quickly, like open rebellion. 
you know, so that's my belief and that's my uh, take on it and that's what the Bible also shows me by my discernment and many, many Protestants and many Catholics and many Orthodox people also. So, okay, I'd, the dietary thing, I, I, I think that's probably a, like a different conversation with somebody else. Okay then, so I'm going to sign off because uh, it's not predestined or anything, but I want to, my free will. And, uh, yeah, I know, Rory, I'm not. Okay then, so, um, okay, Edward Ree, you're gone. All right, let me, in fact, I'm not even going to end the stream yet. I'm just going to have the satisfaction. Of, or one of the admin, no, it's all right, I'll do it myself. Like, what a donut. Like, why would you go in and, ooh. Okay, that's done. I think it's done unless I just remove somebody else. No, I did the right person. Um, okay, but God bless them. Like, and I hope they uh, come to some, some understanding of how to speak with women, how to speak in public, how to speak, quite frankly, manners, uh, good grace, you know, all of that kind of stuff, and not to just have their perversions just out there in public. Apart from that, probably a nice person. I don't know why I just made that uh, like unprovable statement. God loves them. That's the point that I was looking for. Yes, and I'm commanded to, but unfortunately, it's just the name on the screen. I don't, I don't know them. So bless you too, Mohammed. I'm pleased that you come regularly here. We'll have to. Um, hi, Martin. We'll have to get. Um, we'll have to get you, as it were. We'll have to start um, looking at some differences between Islam and Christianity. Oh, Dragon, I don't know. You can look up at the deleted comments. It's pretty disgusting. Um, okay, so yes, Phil, good idea. Uh, like, literally, peace out. Um, and I will, you're very welcome, Deborah. I will uh, see you all again tomorrow. I do have like an hour-long debate filmed from Sunday, but I wanted to... Um, you know, do the typey thing where the words come up on the screen with the references because a couple of times I didn't have access to them. So I sort of paused those lines of um, polemics. But I do have them now. But I am also not lazy, but I have a lot of uni work. So I may type them into the subtitles and then just put it in the title. We'll get there. Don't worry, people. Um, hopefully, yeah, we'll, we will get there. Not hopefully, we will. All right, then hopefully soon is what I was going to say. All right. Uh, <laughs> right, last question being answered. This, oh, I can't get it nearer because it means movement. Um, so I have a vine and a rose and a tiny little stone. So I choose to think of the vine, obviously, as uh, Christ when he says, I am the vine. The rose is for England and, oh, and the stone um maybe the heart of stone that's now turned to flesh but i just made that bit up as i went along but anyhow oh, oh the precious blood that will do it's for precious stone denoting um preciosity that's not a word i'm now officially waffling thank you bart and uh yeah i'll see you all soon god bless bye bye